This being Memorial Day weekend, of course, we always want to remember those who laid down their lives for others. And the reason we do this is we, you know, we hold them in esteem. There's something within them, some kind of virtue that is rare. And uh, it's unusual. And uh, we've actually come to the place in our society where we expect those virtues to be in certain people in our society. Uh, but even though we expect those rare virtues to be among our first responders, uh, that doesn't make those virtues or the people that have them any, wor- any less worth celebrating. You know, as Christians, God has called us to be virtuous people, to be unusual in this respect. And um, today I want to talk about some of the virtues that we should emulate as we continue in our journey through the book of Colossians. So we're in Colossians chapter 3. If you'll take your Bible and turn to Colossians chapter 3, the words will appear on the screen behind me. And uh, we are in Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 17. And if you found the place, would you stand with me, please, in honor of the reading of God's Word. Colossians 3, verses 12 through 17. We read this. Therefore, as God's chosen ones, holy and dearly loved, put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving one another if anyone has a grievance against another. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also are to forgive. Above all, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. And let the peace of Christ, to which you are also called in one body, rule your hearts and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell richly among you, in all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another through psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would grant us a good understanding of your word and how we can apply it to our lives. Father, I pray that as we uh, go through these virtues, that if we find any of them that may be lacking in our own hearts, that you would supply those as we have need. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. In verse 12, it begins with these words, Therefore, (coughs) excuse me, as God's chosen ones, holy and dearly loved, put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And the reason for the virtues, those five virtues that we'll get to at the end of that verse, um, is it, they're all based on what's at the beginning. And what's at the beginning is just a little, little identification of who we are in Christ, that we are God's chosen ones. What does that mean? Well, if it means uh, what I think it means, at the very least, it means that the church is different. The church is unlike other organizations. And so you think, well, you know, how how might the church be different from the United Way or from the YMCA or or something like that? You know, how is the church different from from this uh, nonprofit entity over here? And if you ask the government, they may just look at all of us, all nonprofit entities, it's sort of being the same, you know. Uh, They don't pay taxes on the donations that they receive, and those that make the donations get a tax break and all that. And so the government might not really see a difference between churches and other organizations, but God does. God sees a difference. And, and the difference is essentially this, that we are not, as a, as a church, or as the church, with a capital C, as God's people, wherever we are, um, we are not simply a human institution. We have humans in it, obviously, but we're not just a human institution. We are not just a religious movement. We have a lot of religious people in it, but we're more than just a religious movement. We're more than just a human institution. We're more than just the figment of someone's imagination a long time ago. Uh, We are, at the very essence, a purposeful creation of God. God has created a certain group of people. He's called out from the rest of humanity, people to be his family, to people to be his people, people to carry out the mission that God has for humanity. We have an essential role that we play in God's history of things as things unfold. And so collectively, as God's people, we have been chosen 
to be God's family. And so we are His chosen ones. We are, as the verse says, we are holy. That means we're set apart. We're different. Okay? We are dearly loved. And someone might say, well, doesn't God love everybody? Of course God loves everyone. Okay? Uh, And just like you and I, we might love everyone too. Uh, But the reality is, of course, God's love for everyone is greater than our love for, for strangers. But the reality is that what sets us apart is that we have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We relate to God through belief. And as such, we hold a special place in God's heart. And so we are dearly loved, we are holy, we are God's chosen ones, and therefore we are to put on certain things. Now last week we talked about a lot of different types of uh, clothing, spiritual clothing, uh, that may become torn or ragged or may become soiled or dirtied in some way. And so we are to take off certain things. In in verse 5 of this chapter, we're to take off sexual immorality and a lot of other things that do not uh, benefit others, that do not benefit us, that do not show a love toward our neighbor. In, in, in the next few verses, we are to take off a lot of other things. We are to put off things that uh, we, certain things that we say, whether it's malicious words or slanderous words or lies, things like that. We are to t- put those things away. Uh, th- we are not to wear those things as a part of who we are on a daily basis. But now, in verse 12, we have some virtues that, are, that should replace those vices. And these virtues, there are five of them that Paul lists here. Those virtues are compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And so each one of these virtues is very important, you know, and we are to be compassionate people. And someone might say, well, you know, why, why should I be compassionate? You know, that person's in his mess because of his own doings. They made their own poor decisions, and they should just have to suffer the consequences of their own decisions, and why should I be compassionate toward them? And I think the Lord might remind us, have I not been compassionate toward you? Have all of your decisions been the right ones? Did I not show mercy and compassion to you in spite of some of your own decisions that might have put you in a mess as well? So we ought to be compassionate toward one another, compassionate toward those that are miserable, compassionate toward those that need mercy. And then we come across this idea of kindness. Kindness, I think, is a lost art form, if you want to call it. You certainly won't find it very much, very often on social media, even from Christians, unfortunately. But God calls us to be kind. And someone might say, Well, why should I be kind to that person? They're being mean to me. They're being mean-spirited to me. They're calling me names. Why can't I just sort of give it back to them? You know, twist the knife a little bit. Uh, why, Why can't I do that? And the Lord might remind us that His kindness brought us to repentance. Not when we deserved it. Maybe even when we had bad thoughts about God, bad thoughts about who Jesus is, bad thoughts about His children. But nevertheless, God was kind to us. And he brought us to the point of repentance through his kindness, as Romans chapter 2, verse 4 tells us very explicitly. And so we ought to be kind, even toward those that are not kind to us. And then we come across another one, humility. Humility is a a very challenging uh, thing for people these days. And someone might say, why should I be the only one who's humble? I mean, look at them. They're always patting themselves on the back. They're bragging about everything they do. They're making me look bad at work, you know. They're, they're elevating themselves. They're elevating themselves at school. And why should I be the humble one, you know? The humble guy is the one that doesn't, no one ever notices. Maybe I want someone to notice me, right? I think the Lord might remind us that he's called us to humility. In fact, The Lord Jesus himself, would anyone have any more reason to brag than the Lord Jesus himself? Being a man who's perfect, being a man who never sinned, the only man who's never sinned against God. And yet what did Jesus do? He humbled himself, he made himself a servant. He literally washed the feet of his disciples, the same disciples that hours later would deny him. He washed their feet. He humbled himself all the way to the cross. 
and died a criminal's death on a cross. That's humility. God calls us to humility as well. Then we come across this other virtue, gentleness. Gentleness is also in short supply these days. Someone might say, well, you know, why should I be gentle? You know, I want to be loud. I want to be, I want to be boisterous. I want, to, I want people to notice me. Why should I be gentle toward other people? They're certainly not gentle toward me. Look at all the things that Christians are called. Look at all the things that people are called. Why should we be gentle in return? And I think the Lord might remind us that there's great strength in being a gentle man, in being a gentle woman. There's no strength in giving something back to someone that, that is mean-spirited and ugly and vicious. There's no, there's no good that comes from that. But instead, we ought to be gentle toward those that may not be gentle toward us. And finally, in this brief list, we have the one that no one ever wants to talk about. Patience. Patience. Lord, give me patience tomorrow. You know, no one wants patience today. Why? Because it means we might have to go through something. It means we might have to endure something. But God has called us to endure. God has called us to be patient. And someone might say, well, why should I be patient? I want what I want now. I'm dissatisfied with what I have. I want what I want right now. Why should I have to wait for it? What's the good in waiting for it? And the Lord might remind us, you know, we have all the time in the world. In fact, the Lord might remind us of something even deeper. We have all the time of eternity. So let's be patient. Let's wait. Let's build that into our lives. Let's be patient, especially toward one another. It's important for us to be patient. And so we have these we have these uh, a- attitudes, we have really these virtues that should be a part of our lives. And some of these virtues uh, we can quickly say amen to because uh, th- they're already a part of our lives. And other, uh, others of these virtues, we might say, oh me, instead of amen. Oh me, I need that one. That's in short supply today. I need it, Lord. And so we are different as God's people. Now, I want you to notice something about these these virtues. All of these virtues are internal. has nothing to do with anyone else. These are either things that you are or things that you are not. These are internal. The acting out of them, of course, will be in relationships and others, but these are internal virtues, internal qualities of life. In fact, the Scripture says nothing about the person that offended you. It says nothing about the other guy. It says nothing about the person that is uncompassionate, the person that is unkind, the person that is proud, the person that is not gentle, the person that is not patient. It says nothing about them. This verse has nothing to do with them. It has to do with you. You and me. Anytime there is a problem in a relationship between you and someone else, anytime there is some type of disharmony between you and another, the place to begin is with you. Always. You never can control the other person. The place to begin is with you. We read in the next verse a few other terms. There's two terms here that are crucially important. Both of these have to do with relational virtues. Virtues that are said or done and that are experienced in relationship to other people. Verse 13 continues the thought of verse 12. It says that we should be bearing with one another. The word bearing means enduring. We should be bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a grievance against another, just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you are to forgive. And so this is our standard. Let's talk about these two relational virtues briefly. 
Bearing with other people means putting up with them, even when they fail. Putting up with others, even when they fail. Maybe they fail to meet your expectations. Maybe they just completely fail. But it's putting up with them. It's the idea of this, that you don't take the opportunity of someone else to fa- someone else who's failed, you don't use it as a weapon to destroy them, to belittle them, to crush them. Okay? You don't do that. But you bear with them. You endure their failures. And then you forgive them. The word that's translated forgive has, has a root meaning tied to the word for grace. Forgiveness and grace are completely tied together. In other words, the way that you ought to relate to your family members, the way you ought to relate to your fellow church members, and for others in society, is by being gracious. Grace should permeate your relationship to other people. Commentator Richard Mellick says this. He says, By bearing and forgiving, the conscience is cleansed and the matter forgotten. The burden is lifted, and the offended can think and act like Christ even toward the offender. Harboring resentment and ill will toward another does little good, and to do so is beneath Christians. Anyone can hold grudges, but the mark of Christians is that they do not. They forgive regardless. I think those are beautiful words. And so we must bear with one another, forgive one another. And then there is another virtue. This is an indispensable virtue, the greatest of all virtues. It's listed in the next verse, verse 14. Above all, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Love is the opposite of the things that we read about in chapter 3, verse 5. Let me read that verse again. Paul says, Therefore put to death what belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. Love is the opposite of that. Love is the most important virtue of all. That's why Paul says, above all. It means it's the highest, it's the greatest. It's the most important virtue. If you have love, all of the other virtues that we've read about today come into place. They come into focus in your life. And so we must have love. Paul even calls love the perfect bond of unity. Now this phrase paints a beautiful picture. The perfect bond of unity. What this, that word bond means this. It means chains. It means being tied up in a chain so that you're restricted. A chain constrains you. It restricts you. And that's what love does. Love constrains us. It restricts us. You might say, well, how, how is that? Love is a force that if it's within us, it keeps us from being unloving. It keeps us from being impatient. It keeps us from being unforgiving. It keeps us from being ungracious toward people. Love is a powerful and wonderful chain that you should wrap all around yourself because love has the power to even do this, to keep your mouth quiet when you want to speak up. And that's a hard thing to do sometimes, isn't it? Sometimes it's hard just to swallow it, just to eat it, 
But sometimes it's important because if you don't, what might come out of your mouth will be unloving. Love is a powerful, wonderful chain that constrains, it restricts, it forces us to put others first. You see, only within the restriction of the chain of love are we most free. You might say, well, how, how, is, that, how is that true? How can, how can something that's chaining me up, how can it make me free? Because the alternative is that you're going to get yourself in trouble and then you'll truly be restricted. You'll truly be harmed. And so we must learn to put on the chain of love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Love is an indispensable virtue. And then Paul lists a few more in the very next verse. These, these, ver these virtues here, these are like the icing on top of the cake. It makes it even more beautiful. Verse 15. And let the peace of Christ, to which you were called in one body, rule your hearts and be thankful. The peace of Christ must rule in us. That means the peace of Christ must be the umpire which calls the shots. The umpire which judges what is within bounds and what is out of bounds. And so as believers in Christ, as, as the church, we must ask ourselves the question, what is the peaceful path? What is the way of peace? Because certainly we can all exercise our rights. And if we want to get into Romans, we want to get into 1 Corinthians, we can talk about exercising our rights and, and eating meat, and eating meat might offend our brother. We can all exercise our rights and, and create discord and disunity in the church. And that's not the path of peace. What is the path of peace? What is the way forward to which I put the others in front of my own desires? So we should have the peace of Christ and we should also be thankful. Peace and thankfulness, peace and gratitude are two sides of the same coin. And here's what I mean. Have you ever come across a, across a Christian who's always dissatisfied? I mean, there's a problem here, and there's a problem there, and there's a problem there, and I'm griping this and griping that, always dissatisfied. There's no peace in that person's heart. Why? Because when there's a lack of peace in the person's heart, they're expressing their dissatisfaction all the time. But a grateful heart, a grateful heart is content with what Christ has done. Content with what we have been given. And can I just uh, share a brief word and a compliment to you? We have, for two months now or so, had the ugliest roof in Lubbock. It is obnoxious how ugly it is. It is discolored. It's not even the same shade of dirt. It is multiple shades of dirt. We've had an issue. We were trying to fix some leaks. We've had an issue with, with a contractor, and, and we're working that out. You know what I have not heard anybody in this church do? And I can't tell you how thankful I am. I've not heard anybody ranting and raving and griping and complaining about the roof. It is an obvious eyesore. You can't get around it. I'm told you can see it from Slide Road. I'm told you can see it from Highway 84. Okay, it's not pretty. We're working to fix it. Appreciate your prayers, okay? We'll have some updates, I hope, soon. But more than, more than the roof, I mean, a roof is nothing to God. A roof is nothing to God. What's more important is attitudes. What's more important is harmony and unity and peace in God's family. And so thank you so much. That means a lot. I was not planning on, on going there. It was not part of my notes, but it came to mind. And that's the way it should be. 
And so we're grateful. Even I'm grateful for the dirty roof. Why? Because it rained last week. And we didn't have too many leaks. We had a few. Had a few, but not too many. Okay? And so we're going to fix all these problems, I hope. But thank you so much for this Christ-like attitude that you've had. We've all probably been in churches where it's been less than that. And it's been more hurtful. So we must be people of peace. We must be people of gratitude and thankfulness, knowing that Christ has given us all things. And then in verse 16, Paul says, Let... The word of Christ dwell richly among you. In all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another through psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. He says, let the word of Christ. You know what that implies? That implies that we can take God's word, however you want to interpret the word of Christ, whether you want to say, well, it's the word about Christ or or it's what Christ actually said, you know, the red letters in your red letter Bible, or, or it's the entire Word of God, whatever you wanna, however you want to interpret that, okay? But essentially, biblical teachings, okay, scriptural teachings, which all, you know, ultimately point to Christ, and Christ uh, communicates to us through His Word. The idea of letting the Word of Christ dwell richly among you implies this, that we can restrict it. That we can take the word of Christ, we can take God's word, we can ignore it. We can take God's word, we can disobey it. We can take God's word and we can yes, mentally toss it aside. But instead, Paul is saying, let God's word have freedom in your life. The freedom in your life to guide your decisions. The freedom in your life to evaluate your motivations the freedom in your life to determine your actions. And so as a church, we must always ask two questions. Number one, is the peace of Christ present in the congregation before we make this big decision, whatever big, big decision it might be? And I've unfortunately been in a, uh, in a situation years and years ago where we had a very big decision as a church to make, and yet there was turmoil in the church about something completely separate. And we did not address the turmoil, and we tried to make the big decision, and everything fell apart. And I learned a very important lesson there, that the peace of Christ must rule in the congregation first. And then secondly, in addition to that, when you're making a big decision as a church, you must ask this question, is this decision consistent with the will of Christ? Is it consistent with God's Word? And so then we can move forward. And so the, rule, the Word of Christ must must rule our lives. We must let it rule our lives. It, it must dwell within us. And we must have all wisdom, and we must teach and admonish one another, which we do through preaching, but we must also do this through songs, through music. There's a parallel passage in Ephesians. In fact, Ephesians is a sister passage to Colossians. And you might say, well, what's the difference? Because I see this passage in both, you know, this type of uh, phrasing, a lot of the similar words here are in both books. In a word, Colossians focuses most on, on Christ, and Ephesians focuses most on the church. Okay? Um, but the, the teachings are the same. And the music that we have is very important. Why is music so important? And not just music at our church, but throughout the Christian faith, throughout Christian history, music has always been incredibly important. Why? Because music teaches Music communicates. Music is a vehicle that delivers a message. And so Christian music must have biblical theology. The theology of Christian music must be important. And there's so much Christian music that has poor or little theology to it that it can barely qualify to be Christian. Now, I'm not, and if you're thinking I'm just complaining about uh, you know, the happy clappy songs, all the blue praise music, it ain't no good. I, I'm, not that, I'm not in that camp at all. I'm not complaining about that at all. There's a lot of new praise songs that are not fit to be sung and to be, be part of a worship service. 
But there's some old stuff, too. There's some things in the hymns that are just simply not biblical, some words that are not biblical. There's some southern gospel stuff that's wonderful, and there's some southern gospel songs that's terrible. Absolutely. The devil's in the phone booth calling 911. That's a horrible song, you know. You probably never heard of it. Listen to it if you want, but it's terrible. We'll never sing it here. Um, it has no, no good theology to it. So there, there's all kinds of music out there. We need to be discerning and make sure that Christian music teaches biblical theology. Christian music needs to be spiritual, not secular. You know, God is not my girlfriend. We don't need songs like that. We need songs that honor God for who He truly is, not just express some type of loosey-goosey emotional affection for someone, and you could interchange that, you know, God with my girlfriend and have the same song. That's, that's no good. Christian songs need to be higher, need to be greater. Christian music is only legitimate when it lifts up God or it encourages believers or it evangelizes the lost. Christian music cannot be music that's, that misleads us in any way. It cannot be music that has no meaning whatsoever. It cannot be music that's just focused on self. Christian, so-called Christian music that simply focuses on self, that's not of God. Worship music lifts up God, focuses on God, and encourages us and evangelizes the lost. And so in verse 17, whatever you do, whatever you do, whether it's in word, what you speak, or indeed what you do, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. It's this idea that everything we do must be done in relationship with Jesus. How we treat one another must be done in relationship to Jesus. We must view one another as brothers and sisters in Christ, and God is our Father. And if we're dealing with someone who's not yet a believer in the Lord, we must still view that person as someone made in the very image of God, someone that is due respect, someone that is due honor, even if we vociferously disagree with them. Everything we must do, everything we do must be done in light of who Jesus is because Jesus ultimately has authority over us. He is the Lord. Jesus is the one who provides us our purpose. He's the one who provides us our direction in life. He's the one whose approval we must meet and we can only meet it through faith, through belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. Today, if you are not yet a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you can be. You can be in Christ by understanding who Jesus is. He's Lord over all. What he did for you, he died on a cross and he rose from the grave. And he did it for you. He died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sins. He rose from the grave to give you life eternal. And if you trust in him and believe in him, confess him as Lord, he will respond and say yes. He will receive you unto himself.